Read from the prophet Nahum. N-A-H-U-M. Nahum. Nahum is one of the minor prophets. He is not minor in the sense that he is not important. He has a word from the Lord, and that is important. Amen. So, if you will find the prophet Nahum, it's right behind prophet Micah. And uh, I want to read to you the first 12 verses in the first chapter. I am reading from the Living Bible today, and I'm reading it on purpose. I studied with King James, and I studied with the New American Standard, and I also read the New Translation, the message, and then I chose the Living Bible. It is very, very clear in what it has to say. Nahum chapter 1 verse 1, this is the vision God gave to Nahum who lived in, lived in Elkosh concerning the impending doom of Nineveh. Now you remember last Sunday morning, my old friend Jim Williams was here and he preached from the prophet Jonah. Jonah was sent by God to Nineveh. He didn't want to go. And he had a whale of an experience. <laughs> he uh, got in a storm and they <coughs> threw him overboard and uh, a fish swallowed him. <coughs> and he repented of his sin and God spoke to the fish and he spit him out on dry land and Jonah went and preached to Nineveh. And you remember he preached to Nineveh and they all listened to his message and they all repented and God spared the city. Now, Nahum is sent to Nineveh. It's just been roughly 150 years since they had a great revival with the preaching of Jonah. And so Nahum is sent with a message of doom to Nineveh. <coughs> they had a great revival, but it didn't last. You know, every generation has to experience the power of God or it's going to get stale in the whole nation. And this is the message that God sends to Nineveh just 150 years after they've had a great revival. God is jealous over those he loves. That is why he takes vengeance on those who hurt them. He furiously destroys their enemies. God is slow getting angry. But when aroused, his power is incredible, and he does not easily forgive. He shows his power in the terrors of the cyclone, and in the raging storms, clouds billowing dust beneath his feet. At his command, the oceans and rivers become dry sand. The lush pastures of Bashan and Carmel fade away. The green forest of Lebanon wilt. In his presence, mountains quake and hills melt. The earth crumbles and its people are destroyed. Who can stand before an angry God? His fury is like fire. The mountains tumble down before he's angry. The Lord is good. When trouble comes, he's the place to go. And he knows everyone who trusts in him.
but he sweeps away his enemies with an overwhelming flood. He pursues them all night long. What are you thinking of, Nineveh, to defy the Lord? He will stop you with one blow. He won't need to strike again. You, he, <clears throat> he tosses his enemies into the fire like a tangled mass of thorns. They burst into flames like straw. Who is this king of yours who dares to plot against the Lord? But the Lord is not afraid of him, though he build his army million strong. The Lord declares it will vanish. God cannot be defeated by men. And then in the second chapter of the book of Nahum I just want to read verse 1 Nineveh you are finished you are already surrounded by enemy armies sound the alarm man the ramparts muster your defenses full force and keep a sharp watch for the enemy attack to begin God says the end is coming, Nineveh. You better get ready. And in chapter 3, I want to read the first five verses. Woe to Nineveh, city of blood, full of lies, crammed with plunder. Listen, hear the crack of the whips as the chariots rush, toward, rush forward against her, wheels rumbling. Horses' hoofs pounding and the chariots clattering as they bump wildly through the streets. See the flashing swords and glittering spears in the upright, upraised arms of the cavalry. The dead are lying in the streets. Bodies, heaps of bodies everywhere. Men stumble over them and scramble to their feet and fall again. All because Nineveh sold herself to the enemies of God. The beautiful, faithless, faithless city, mistress of deadly charms, enticed the nations with her beauty and then taught them to worship her false gods, bewitching people everywhere. No wonder I stand against you, saith the Lord of hosts, and now all the earth, will see your nakedness and shame. Nineveh is going to be destroyed. Now you notice in the bulletin my subject matter says when a nation forgets God. It is so strange to me that a nation, a whole group of people, can just forget about God. I'm not so sure that that is foreign to what we're experiencing in our own nation today. So many people have no thought about the Lord or about faithfulness to God or the fact that God will recompense those who turn away from Him. Nahum says the destruction of Nineveh is coming. And you know it took place in the year 612 B.C. Now, if you figure, Jonah preached in about 750, 760. It's been just about 150 years since Jonah preached the message of repentance to the city of Nineveh. And they all repented. They had a revival. So Nineveh knows what revival is. Who knows, they may have marked it with a national holiday and said, we still remember old Jonah's preaching and how our fathers turned back to God at that time. Now, Nahum is not saying that God is fickle. God is not fickle, folks. Not at all. Nahum preached that God is slow to anger. We know that. 
Has God been patient with you in your life? Sure he has. He's been patient with every last one of us. He's been patient with America. The United States of America has been singularly blessed of God more than any nation I know. And yet, we turn away. We act like we forget about God. Now, God is not going to acquit the wicked. He may be slow to anger, but God's judgment is sure. And God says, that first verse in chapter 3, Nineveh is finished. They're done. As the people listened to Nahum, as he brought this message, they must have thought, wonder where this heretic came from. Wonder where this nut is coming from. Why is he coming and preaching destruction of our city, of our nation, Assyria? You know, it was a walled city. It had a 1,800 acres inside the walls of the city. The wall was tall enough and wide enough. They had chariot races around the city. It was a rich, extravagant city that they lived in. It was the capital of the Assyrian nation like Washington, D.C. to us. It was the capital city, and the prophecy of Nahum uses some very harsh words as he speaks to them. And Nahum affirms some truths about God. And let me just mention some of the truths that he affirms. The first one is this. God is a jealous God. And he does avenge evil and wrath and sin with wrath. God takes vengeance on his enemies. Now it says here, God is slow to anger. But it also says he is great in power. And so it may take God a while to get around to the punishment for sin, but it will come. And Nahum, and, and Nahum mentions all of this. He says, God's way is like the whirlwind. The clouds are like the dust of the wheels of a chariot. And we are told, not only is God jealous and will he avenge, but God cares about his people. God cares. You know, we say it this way in our day, God loves you, my friend. And there's not one person sitting here this morning that God doesn't love you personally. God has your best interest at heart. God is not trying to deprive you of joy and happiness and blessing, God wants your life to be full of meaning. And that's the only way you can have a full meaningful life is with the Lord. He is a jealous God. Now that raises a negative thought maybe of a, to us that uh, God, is he overprotective? Is he so possessive? Is, uh, is God so hot-tempered? You see people that have a hot temper. I mean, all at once, you're talking to somebody and they just lose it. They just blow off like a skyrocket. They just erupt. They're so hot-tempered. And they, this, I want you to know, God is not like that. And the Bible says he is not. Now God is jealous over his glory. 
So many times we want to steal God's glory and take credit for something ourselves. Listen, all the glory in this world belongs to God. And I hear Brother Brett when he prays, and he prays that we know you deserve it all. He does. The glory belongs to God, to his name. And God loves his people. You know, you think about it this way. If somebody were to attack a member of your family, you guys, your wife, somebody comes and they attack your wife and they wound her and they beat her and they disrespect her and they hurt her and she's broken and bleeding, would you get upset? Well, I hope so. I'm sure she would like to know you feel that way too. You know, and your children, somebody abuses your children in some way and you get upset. Hey, you can get on me, you can get on a lot of things in my family, but don't bother my kids. You see, and God is like that. God loves you so much. And God is patient and long-suffering. Now, we need to understand that God will defend his people. And that's what Nahum is saying here. Now, another thing he tells us, he tells us that God will judge them that attack and hurt and oppose his people. God takes their side. You know, the guy, the idea that uh, God is passionate about defending his people, that's exactly right. And the Bible says that. They believe that God, Nahum believed that God was great in power, and he said, who are you to oppose God? You know, <laughs> folks, I don't know why the people in places of leadership and responsibility in government want to make decisions that are hurtful to the righteous, holy purpose of God. Because God will hold them accountable. Dwight L. Moody used to ask, what if the governor of your state decided to be merciful and release all of the criminals that are in our prisons loose on society. What would you think? What if Governor Rick Perry just said, okay, we're emptying all the prisoners out now. They're all free to go. I wouldn't be in favor of that. I would not be. And, you know, to turn people like that loose on decent people that try to do what's right, that governor would probably get kicked out of office. You see, God will not allow the sin sinful, rebellious world to disturb the peace and joy of heaven. God says, and this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. God will be victorious. And the point is that mercy and judgment are not contradictory. They are complementary. They fit together. God's love for truth and goodness and love for his people requires that he eliminate things that threaten that which is right and holy and good. And God passes judgment. We are told that God never acts in a hasty manner. When we talk about people who are jealous, or we talk about people who are full of wrath and vengeance, and we think of somebody who acts impulsively. You're sitting in a place and somebody acts on an impulse, they get up and this has happened over and over again. Somebody shows up and they 
jerk out their gun and start shooting and it's on an impulse and and you know God is not that way he is slow <coughs> to anger we see that demonstrated in the book of Jonah God had told Jonah I'm going to destroy that city you go preach and tell them to repent and Jonah didn't want to do it finally he goes <laughs> reluctantly and he gets over there and preaches and they all repent and listen to what old Jonah said I knew that thou art a long-suffering God and that you would forgive those people that is the way God is God wants to forgive and uh, God doesn't act hastily now this brings me to the very first thing I want to say in this verse of scripture that the certainty of judgment is there I want you to know dear one there's going to be a judgment day and God's word says so every one of you will render an account of himself unto God <coughs> every one of us have an appointment with Almighty God. Now with this book, Nahum, as our background, the prophecy of Nahum is very, very specific. You don't misunderstand what Nahum's talking about. He wrote, you would think that he wrote after the destruction was complete because he describes it so clearly but it was written before the judgment came. God said, this judgment is going to come. It, Nineveh will be destroyed. And so, help me, God, it happened in the year 612. You know, when he says here in chapter 1, in verse number 8, let me read it, it says, he, but he sweeps away his enemies with an overwhelming flood. He pursues them all night long. This is a metaphor of speech. It is an illustration that all at once, whew, the judgment swept them away. You know, uh, you remember the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center. <coughs> One day, here are those two beautiful skyscraper buildings that line the skyline of New York. And there, there they are. And before nightfall, they're gone. Just suddenly, it all was swept away. I'll never forget those images that I saw on my TV screen of those people streaming out of those buildings, those that could get out and running down the street and all of that dust and all of that masonry, those bricks and all of that falling on those people and they were terrorized. Just that quick, it happened. And that's the image that Nahum gives us. The city of Nineveh was thought to be impregnable. It was invincible. It could not fall. But it was destroyed so quickly and so completely. It is interesting how accurate the account is in the book of Nahum. The siege of Nineveh by the rebel army of Persians, Medes, and Babylonians. Usually, an unusually heavy rain accompanied the attack that came. And it rained so much that it caused the rivers to undermine the wall of the city. And 21 furlongs, that's nearly three miles of the wall around the city of Nineveh collapsed and the enemy army just overran the city suddenly. And the people were without any defense. In verse 10, we are told that the city, this is what he says. He, he says in verse 10, 
He tosses his enemies into the fire like a tangled mass of thorns. They burst into flames like straw. It was just spontaneous combustion almost. And it all happened so rapidly. In Nahum chapter 2, verses 8 to 10, we are told that there's going to be extensive looting that's going to take place in the city. It says, Nineveh is like a leaking water tank. Her soldiers slip away, deserting her. She can't hold them back. Stop, stop, she shouts, shouts, but they keep on running. Loot the silver, loot the gold. There seems to be no end to the treasures. Her vast uncounted wealth is stripped away. The enemies overran the city. They took everything, gold, silver, all the things that the treasures. Where do you think Nineveh had got them? They got them from their enemies. When the Assyrians captured a city, they looted the city. They took everything that was worth anything and they took it home. And now God said, that's what's going to happen to them. The image that Nahum gives us here. He says, there's going to be extensive looting. They are going to take all the treasures and the city of Nineveh had great wealth, but they lost it all. It's interesting that in about 1840, the archaeologists began to dig over there in that country. They finally located the city of Nineveh. And as the archaeologists had to dig and dug up that historic plate, they found not one piece of silver or gold in all of the ruins. It was all taken away. The judgment of God was so complete. The point of this is this, that the word spoken by Nahum, it wasn't some poetic thing that just tickled your ears. It was a true glimpse of the future. They were not figurative. They were literally fulfilled. God's judgment was so complete. You know, the reason for the judgment. I think you can surmise the reason already. This important question. Why was God so angry with the city of Nineveh? Why was God so judgmental on the Assyrians? What had took place? In about 150 to 140 years, Jonah had come and preached repentance and the king all the way down to the last person had repented of their sins and God had mercy on the city of Nineveh. But in just that short a time, they had gone back so completely vile, so completely arrogant, so completely in disregard for God that the judgment of God fell on these people. They were vicious in their actions. If you read the first three verses of the third chapter of the book of Nineveh, he calls them a city of blood because of the vicious manner in which they went about in conquest of their enemies. They would make promises. You surrender to us and we will show mercy. We will not slaughter. And yet when they people surrendered, they slaughtered them in the streets. Old, young, children, they were all slaughtered in the streets. And when they captured their enemies, those that were taken away captive, they would put a big ring through their lips. And then they would put a chain, and one person was chained to another by a big hook in their lips. And that's the way they saw that they were led back to captivity. These Ninevites were barbarians. They were without mercy. You know, and this was 
reminded me as I read this in commentaries <coughs> and in history books, it reminded me of the Nazis when they had the Jewish Holocaust and they killed six million people. They were terrorists. They were ruthless. They were cruel. They were murderers. They were immoral. That was all the things you can think of. And I want you to know, God takes note. When compassion dies within a people, judgment is sure to come. The Ninevites were cruel, but they were idolaters. Verse 4 in this third chapter of Nineveh, in the third chapter of Nahum says these people were morally corrupt. They were without principle. They indulged themselves. They worshipped pagan gods. They worshipped Ishtar, which was the god of fertility. It was the god of sexual passion. It was the god of war. They worshipped all of this. And Nahum said these people are going to be exposed publicly. In fact, he says the queen shall be led naked. You see, God judged them. These people engaged in all kinds of sorcery. Now sorcery is where we talk about Satan worship and we talk about worship of demons and I want you to know there is a lot of that in our country today. People that worship charms and trinkets and, and they commune with the dead. You know, God's Word condemns that kind of thing, folks. I don't know how people get to the place they think that they're going to commune with the dead. You know, one of the most popular shows on TV, it's been a couple of years ago, I think, I remember just vaguely about it, called Crossing Over. It was a science fiction series, and it had this guy that was supposed to be the sorcerer. They didn't call him the sorcerer. They called him, I think, John Edward, as best I remember. And John was getting messages from the dead and delivering it to people. I tell you, you can get a message from life. That's the Lord Jesus Amen. that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But there's no communing with the dead. There's such an increase in occult and witchcraft and Satanism and people consult their crystals and, and uh, you look as you drive down the street and sometimes you'll see people have little crystals hanging off the, the, the mirror in their automobile and that is a, an offshoot of this kind of, of uh, Satanism and, and evil spirit worship. The Ninevites, they were arrogant. If you look at verses 8 and 10 in the third chapter there, it, it speaks of how they were. It says, Are you any better than Thebes? Straddling the Nile, protected on all sides by the river, Ethiopia, and whose whole land of Egypt were her mighty allies, and she would call on them for infinite, infinite assistance as well as Put and Libya, but they fell. Their people were led off as slaves. Their babies were dashed to death against the stones of the street. He talks about the judgment that fell on those people. The Assyrians, they were arrogant. They were cruel. They destroyed the Egyptian city of Thebes a city that was thought to be immune to attack. But they attacked it and completely destroyed it. Listen, these people thought they didn't have to live by God's rules. But they were wrong. And I want you to know, dear ones, as the people of God today, we know God says if you draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. We have 
have to live by God's rules. And that's what the message of Nahum was about. It was a lesson about judgment. If you read the book of Nahum and Jonah and all those prophets back there, and you think it doesn't have any application to me or to our nation, you're wrong. It does have an application for us. We need to keep that fact in our minds. Listen, I have a healthy respect for the ocean, don't you? I realize that ocean is powerful. You can be out there and there are all kinds of sharks and those kind of things that come and just eat you alive. And you can be out there and the undertow will get you and drag you away and drown you. Listen, water is fun and beautiful, but we better not forget that while you can dive and snorkel and swim in the water, you must always be aware that there is a danger that you can lose your life. And when we talk about God, my dear people, He is a loving sustainer, a friend. He is the one who will never abandon or leave us. God will be there. But we must not presume on His grace. We must not take Him for granted. Are you presuming on God's grace? Is God, is the peace and the joy of the Lord in your life? Are you really satisfied with your relationship to God? If not, maybe you're not being obedient to the Word. If not, you know, so many times we want to justify and rationalize our thoughts and our behaviors and what we do and we think, good old God, He'll understand. You may be wrong. God may understand more than you know. And he sees right down into the depths of your heart on the national level. Let me say, God does judge a nation. You know, I, I know that God has blessed. I can't help but wonder... How long is God going to remain silent? How long is He going to suffer with America? We who murder a million and a half babies in the abortion mills of our country, how long do you think God's going to put up with innocent blood like that? How long do you think that God is going to tolerate a nation where to talk about Christian conversion in public life or in public school life is not an acceptable pattern? How long is God going to tolerate the broadcast of immorality and profanity wholesale across the airways of our nation. How long is God going to permit? How much witchcraft and sorcery and mysticism is God going to put up with till he finally says, enough? That's what he said. To the prophet Nahum, he said, listen, you hear the crack of the whips? Judgment was coming, and God said, because Nineveh sold herself to the enemies of God, the beautiful, faithless city, the mistress of deadly charm, they enticed the nations with their beauty and taught them to worship false gods. How long? And God said, it's enough right now. 
I'm not trying to say that God is going to destroy America. I don't say that. But I want you to know it ripped from my heart when I think how God pronounced his judgment on the city of Nineveh just a hundred and forty or fifty years after a great revival had swept the land and everybody repented and now God says it's enough. They're going to be judged. Faith no longer existed in that nation. You hear the sober warning. You know, maybe you grew up in a Christian home. Maybe, uh, maybe you remember how mom and dad prayed. I don't remember Mother and dad prayed until after I was 17 years old. But I'm so glad there came a time in the life of my family when my mother and dad turned their hearts to God and it made a change in everybody in our family. I say to you again this morning, my dear people, God says he is a refuge for them that trust in him. God says, look, and you'll be amazed. I'm going to do something in your lifetime that you will have to see to believe. God says that to us. You know, as I come to the close this morning, I want to urge you that you seek the Lord in your own heart. I realize Peggy and I have a relationship together, but I realize that I cannot seek the Lord for her. She must do that herself. And she cannot do it for me. I must do it. And in your family, as the father, as the mother, you need to see that you set an example of holiness and righteousness and worship of the Lord before your children. Learn from what Nahum says to the city of Nineveh. God said, enough, and he destroyed the city. I pray God that there will be a turning our hearts back to the Lord. Can I read you a verse? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11. Listen. All these things happen to them as examples, as object lessons to warn us against doing the same thing. They were written down so we could all read about them and learn from them in these last days as the world nears its end. Why do you think God wrote these things in our word? So that we can learn something. And we need to listen to the voice of the Lord. As God says, seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thought. And let him return unto God, saith the Lord. Turn to the Lord. If you are here and you've never trusted in the Lord Jesus, I want you to know, my friend, that God wants you to be his child. And he wants you to accept Christ as your personal Savior. Would you come and do that? If you don't have assurance in your heart, that you have made peace with God. Do it this morning. Ask God to forgive your sin and cast yourself upon Him. If you are a Christian, but you're not a part of a church here where you live, we invite you to consider join the church in this community and be a part of the work of God.
we're going to sing a hymn. What number, Tom? 617. Number 617. And while we sing this hymn, we invite you to come and make a decision concerning your relationship with God.